body of believers and Lord just to search to the deeper depths of of who you are and who you've called us to be and Lord we just ask that you reveal uh, more of you Lord in, in our time of worship in our time of a prayer today in our time of seeking after you Lord it says that your know, faith comes by hearing Father God and let us hear the words from the throne this morning Lord that would transform our hearts and our minds Father God that leaving this place Father God that we would not be the same as when we came in and Lord that the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into every truth Father God that reminds us and reveals to us more of who you are. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, I'm going to do a teaching on, on Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Pretty much be in this this chapter the whole time. And and to me, this is the title of this guy is a reminder of his gifts. His gifts. And this might be a little bit a little bit different, if you will, or different approach. It's not necessarily a, a common chapter, but definitely what the Lord has laid on my heart this week uh, for this. And we'll start, uh, I'm going to be reading out of the NLT. And we'll start with verse 1, and it says, I ask then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you realize what the scriptures say about this? Elijah, the prophet, complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And do you remember God's reply? He said, no, I have 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal. Verse 5 says, it is the same today for a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, his, undeser uh, sorry, his undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works, for in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. When we look at this, this passage of Scripture, and we see that uh, first we have to look at the, the context um, from, from where it's being written. Uh, we have, so this is the Apostle Paul is, is writing this. He's coming to the place of really being a... Um, uh, if he didn't mention it yet, he's, he's about to mention, he goes, I am a, I'm, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. All right. And so he's, he's writing this a, 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 to the Roman church. Uh, so to, to those Gentiles that have converted and, and he's going over and explaining to them that God has uh, not, necessarily abandon Israel, but that God is, is continuing to do his work, uh, even though uh, in large parts Israel has rejected him, he's going to continue this work with, uh, with the Gentile people, all right? Gentile just being anybody that is not 
uh, Jewish or out of, out of the lineage of Abraham. Uh, Paul clarifies that, that he is that he's Jewish and that God, because God is still dealing with him and still using him, that definitely God hasn't um, abandoned him. And then he gives the example of, of Elijah, saying that, that Elijah came to a place one time and, of thinking that he was the only one left and that he was the, um, uh, that God might as well just kill them all and start over and, and, and all those types of things. And God responds to, to Elijah and says, you know what, I still have 7,000 prophets that have never bowed or served that other God. And so Paul continues to, uh, uh, to share with this church about grace. And he begins to share this, this aspect that uh, grace isn't necessarily something that we deserve. Grace isn't something that, uh, uh, that we have to work for, but that grace is given free and undeserved. In other words, it, it doesn't necessarily matter that, that you're that your Jewish heritage or that your Gentile heritage, Paul is driving the point home here that the gift of God's grace, uh, what, what it really is free and undeserved. In other words, if it's undeserved, then there's nothing that we can do in order to, to get it, right? There, there's not, uh, there's not a, a necessarily a process. Once, once after salvation, that aligns us to the place of being grafted in to the kingdom of God. Verse 7 says, So this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. A few have, uh, sorry, a few have the ones of God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened, as the, as the scriptures say. God has put them into a deep sleep. To this day, He has shut their eyes so they do not see, and closed the ears so they do not hear. Verse 9, Romans 11 says, says Likewise, David said, Let their bountiful table become a snare and a trap that makes them think all is well let their blessings cause them to stumble and let them get what they deserve let their eyes go blind so they cannot see and let their backs be bent forever Paul begins to quote the, some of the scriptures that, that David had recorded, and it begins to talk about that e even then in David's time to, to the, the present time, that the, the people have gone blind, that they, they've gotten to the place where they can't see. They've gotten to the place where uh, that it's, it says there that their tables, their bountiful tables, their tables full of everything will be a snare or, or be a trap. And, and I, as, as I was reading this uh, and studying this uh, passage of Scripture, I was like, that's very uh, depictive of today's times. They're, they're, uh, we, we live in a world that a lot of times, if everything is going good, in, in a sense, uh, they, they uh, you know, especially sometimes I think in the, with the American mentality that we've, you know, having everything, that, that bountiful table, that, that plenty aspect becomes a, a snare. Uh, we find comfort in, in those things sometimes and, and, and don't necessarily rest upon the assurance or the trust in, in God as we should. Um, there, there's... Another side of that sometimes that we feel like that because people, we see that they're bountiful or we see that uh, we have a perception, I'll, I'll say it like that, we have a perception that they're bountiful, that, that we are lacking something that, should, that, you know, that we should have as well. I, I run into this from time to time. Uh, especially in people in other countries, they they're like, well, you're in, you're in America, you're you're rich, and, and maybe rich by the standards of 
uh, of the rest of the world. You know, the rest of the world typically manages to live on less than a dollar a day. All right, and you, you put it across, you know, and so when you measure it by that standard, yeah, okay, I, I am rich, but you don't, you don't understand the other side of that. You know, I, I, I've explained this uh, to numerous friends in other countries. They, they feel like, well, you're here. Uh, you know, they don't understand that the cost of living here, to, to be here, that it, co you know, every, everybody makes this money, so that means that a lot of people also have to spend that money so everybody else can make that money, right? It, and so it, 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 it's a two-edged sword sometimes when we look at it that way. In verse 11, it says, Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, Think how much greater a blessing the world will share when they finally accept it. When we look at it from, from this perspective, this is not typically something that's often taught or, or looked at, but Paul's saying, he says, look how much God, you know, we, we love the world, right? And then he, but he, he offered that salvation to the Jewish people first, but they rejected him. Right. And now that it's open to the Gentiles and and we're thankful for that. Right. And, and he said, how much better is it going to be that this whole world receives the blessing and, and accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior? In 13, it says, I'm saying all of this, especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this, for I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have, so I might save some of them. Paul's heart here as an apostle, so we look at the word apostle and what that is. Apostle is somebody that is uh, building, all right? That's, that's the purpose of an apostle, all right? Uh, this is a word that often gets misused in our church culture today. Uh, uh, you can look at our history uh, in, in the last 50, 60 years, and it goes from everybody was, uh, it seems like everybody was pastors, you know, and then, and then they started putting labels, okay, well, well, they're an evangelist, and so that, you know, evangelist so-and-so is going to be here, and, and that's, that's, all, that's all well and good, and then it got to be where in, in the 80s and the 90s, well, everybody becomes bishop, right, we're going to use the word bishop, and in the last probably 20 years, now we're starting to use the word apostle, all right, and all of those are different callings within God, that's not what I'm saying, but a lot of times they, those terms get used uh, and not necessarily uh, in, in the correct form or fashion. Somebody that's an evangelist evangelizes. Uh, they, their, their goal is to, to bring the lost to the church. And that's, that's, that's important. It's, we're all one body, right? And it takes all those members and for that, that to happen. A bishop is somebody that's overseeing a body, all right? And so, uh, but an apostle is, is somebody that is building. Now, that could be um, a physical building. That could be, uh, uh, or in, in spiritual aspects, somebody that's building ministries, something, somebody that's building uh, places, you know, where it might be schools, it might be orphanages, it might be places where the word of God can be instilled and taught. That's the work of an apostle. And so, um, when we look at, Paul's saying, he says, look, my goal here, uh, he goes, I want to share this with you, but I, 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 I really long for the people of Israel to, you know, to grasp the blessing that God has for, for not only the Gentiles, but for them as well. You know, sometimes that word here is jealous, and it kind of has a, a, negative, uh, a negative connotation about it, but, but that's that's Paul's heart uh, speaking, speaking there. That I, 
that I might save some. You know, that, that's reiterated in his letters to, in the Corinthians church, right? Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and 22, Paul, Paul goes and talks about, he says, I become all things to all men that I might save some. That's, that's truly his heart. That's, if you could sum up his, his heart, that's where he's at. And he, and he goes on in verse 15 here in Romans 11. He says, For since their rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance be even more wonderful. It will be, a, uh, be life for those who were dead. He's reiterating the fact that by choosing Christ, by accepting the salvation, that those that were dead will now experience life. In verse 16, it says, And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy. Just as the entire batch of dough is holy because the portion given as the offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. All right. Slow down, Brother Paul. You, you, you're throwing some stuff at us in, the, uh, in our Western culture here that we might not understand. All right. And so he, he goes in, and so the, the first of 16 says, and since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants. So he, he's talking about, oftentimes, you know, it talks about Israel, it talks about the God of Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, or sometimes it'll say Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so it goes to that. He says, since they were holy, in other words, what does holiness mean? Holy means uh, it's another form of righteousness. It's, it's right standing with God, that it's acceptable, right? The, the, the priest, once the holies of holies was built, whether it would be in the tabernacle or in the temple, the, the priest had to go through a process in order to become holy, Okay, there, there is a process in order for us to become holy. All right, the, the priest's process, uh, they had to bathe, they had to wear certain garments, they had to withstand from certain things uh, for, for days on end, and, and so they got to the place of uh, preparing themselves to be able to go into the presence of God. All right, there, there is a... Uh, uh, a process for us we know that God is omnipotent we know that he's everywhere but there's something about being right with him and being right in his presence to to experience the fullness of who he is right and he's going on and explaining this is because those patriarchs were holy he says now the entire body can be holy Right, that there, there was there was right standing with him. We're coming from the same line, and and he, he goes and says, just as the the batch of dough is holy, because the portion given as an offering is holy. What 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 Paul's referring to is after the harvest. Okay, after the harvest, they would get that all the wheat has been gathered up, and they would begin to make bread. All right, and they and and the custom says that they would begin to make a loaf or a batch of bread, and it was their tithe. Okay, so so the tithe might have been given on the wheat, but it was also given when everything come together because the the wheat was broken down and made bread. All right, stereotype of Jesus here. All right, that's 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 what it's referring to, and so here. That bread is made, and that first piece of bread. Now, if you've ever baked bread in the oven or been around it, it, it fills the house, right? And there's something about it there. But they would take that fir those first loaves of bread, and they would take them as an offering. 
And that was the purification process by that tithe on that bread that made the rest holy. Right? That made the rest of it holy because the gift and the things that was given, it, it, it blessed everything else. This is a spiritual principle like when it, get, comes, when it comes to tithing, right? That the tenth is given in order to uh, make the rest, make the 90% uh, do what it's supposed to do, right? Does that make sense? Uh, and so here, Paul is using that, that aspect as, as an analogy that, look, this portion is given, and this portion, once it's given, is holy. That means the remainder of the dough, that everything else, that the, that the bread is there, that's going to bless that as well. He says, in the latter part of that, that verse, he says, for if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. And verse 17 says, but some of those branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off, and you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree, that's important here, a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing from God, uh, 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 the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, and sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. So Paul compares this with a second analogy of saying, look, God created a tree with Abraham. And it seemed like it was just a single tree at first, right? And it began to grow, and a lot of the tree has rejected God. So there was branches uh, broken off and, and cut off. And we could definitely refer back to John 15 where it talks about the vine and the branches and those things. But, but, but here he says, but you were a wild olive tree. In other words, that you were uh, this, this olive tree that was just kind of growing sporadically somewhere, right? And he says, and, and Think, think about the gardener. If you've ever seen anybody graph a tree in, it, it's kind of amazing. They, they take this piece and the original tree has to be cut and then the, the, grafted, the grafted piece has to be cut and they have to take it and they bind it and then after a while, you can't tell the difference between the two. Right? And that's Paul's beautiful analogy about us being grafted in. That there's no separation between what Abraham had to now what we have as Gentiles. He says, well, you may say those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. Paul's saying, hey, Check your, check your theology here, right? Don't, don't think too highly of yourself that those things were removed so you could be here. But the reason that they were broken off is because they lacked belief in Christ. They, they rejected the chief cornerstone, right? They, we, they rejected Christ himself. And it says, um, and you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not um, spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. So God has a standard, right? God has uh, a standard that we must live by in order for uh, us to be grafted and stay within the tree that he has planted, right? In verse 22, it says, Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who disobey, but kind to you if you continue to trust in His kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. To 
to me, that word severe is kind of a tough word, right? We, we, we think of that in the sense of, you know, God's a mean God, and we, we, we think of God with, you know, thunder and lightning and, and all of those things. But God has standards, right? God is established, uh, and his, his standards are beyond fair, and it's, it's just for us to, to believe. In verse 24, it says, You by nature were a branch out from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature by grafting you into his, his uh, cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back to the tree where they belong. How many knows that there's, there's enough for God, right? That... That made me think, my, my grandpa used to sing the song that there's room at the cross. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. And, 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 and to me, that's a, that's, that's a good reminder of uh, how big God is and that it's not necessarily that, that we're grafted in and, and somebody else is going to be left out. But everybody that's left out is left out because of choices. In... In verse 25, it says, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, that you will not feel proud about yourselves, but of, uh, sorry, you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of, of Gentiles come to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved as the scriptures say. Mm. Uh, this, this was one of those passages that uh, I'd heard a lot uh, as, as a, uh, I guess for years, and reading it in this different translation or in the, in the NLT as opposed to the King James, um, we, we see that um, there's a, it's a little bit different here. And, but it, some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. That word full... In the, in the Greek, um, oh, it just escaped me. It is, um, let, me, let me look. I know, I know it might not be as important to you, but it's important to me to, uh, pleroma, the word pleroma. And basically that's the same word that gets used with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's the same, that was basically just, it, it, it's the word that gets used for uh, a, a fullness, right? It's, it's maybe even the same word that they would use like to fill a ship or something like that. But that, when we look at that uh, scripture, until, but this will, only lasts until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. This is a prophetic. This is a prophetic scripture, as as he's talking about that the Gentiles fully come to Christ, and he says, and then, and then, so all Israel will be saved, as the scripture say, right? It talks about that uh, the one who rescues will come down from Jerusalem. And he will turn, uh, and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, and I will take away their sins. Right? He he's beginning, he's going through, and, and he's quoting this this passage of scripture from uh, Isaiah, and he, he's talking about how that. 
Look, when the Israel's fully come, well, I'm sorry, when the Gentiles fully come, uh, then there's going to be something that awakens the people of Israel. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's easy to say that it could be any day now, right? But they've been saying that for, for many years. Um, but I, you have to rest upon the fact and the truth upon it that says, you know what? We're one day closer. It, it's one day closer. And so, does anybody have any thoughts or reflections about that? In, in verse 29, I think this is impor important. And we'll kind of finish up with this. It says, For God's gifts and His call can never be withdrawn. You know, the King James there says that the, the callings of God can, without repentance, right? That they're... Uh, King James says, for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. In other words, that what God has given us, he'll never take away from us. But it's really our actions that remove ourselves from him. That's true. That's true as the church. That's true as us as individuals. No matter if we're in that place like Elijah that felt like that he was all alone. Uh, we all go through times like that. Uh, but God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful that he continues to give and he continues to, to uh, intercede on our behalf. And it's up to us to understand and to be grateful and to be humbled that, that he's grafted us in, that he's brought us in, that he's made a way even if it seems to be no way, as the prophet says, you know, that, that God has made a way for his gifts to be given to us. He's brought those gifts to us. Amen? Any, anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a, it's like I said, it was a, that chapter just kind of was one of those things as I was reading this week, it just kind of stuck out to me. And I was like, I've got to bring out these points for Sunday. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed that and encouraged and we'll, <laughs> we'll take a we'll take a break and then uh, we'll start service at 1030. So.